This week on Arts Insight, a tasty treat elevated to an art form. Anything is possible. So having that vision of what'll go, I think is the art of gelato making. An urban space reimagined to bring out the kid in all of us. The whole idea with the urban conga is the idea of the conga line. We're always down to collaborate. We want people to jump in line and work with us. A celebration of the 3D form. They can have all of their services and all of their processes right here in Loveland, and it has just produced a large community of people who really value art. And the art of crafting craft beer labels. We're really into making these special products for ourselves and for the people that we love to drink beer with. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Today, we're on the boulevard, Heights Boulevard to be exact, where they've done it again, taken the esplanade and turned it into a park full of art. We'll find out how True South differs from the previous True North and what fun, whimsical, and downright entertaining pieces are on display. But first, just a few blocks from where we are, a family tradition has been elevated to a true art form, passed down through the generations. Making gelato is something that you do with your hands and your mind. The art is in having the taste and having the vision to know what's going to taste good. It's a little bit more than the recipe. It's the artistic approach of the ingredients. Anything is possible. So having that vision of what will go I think is the art of gelato making. My name is Louis Camella. I'm the owner of Italia Ice Cream Company and Gelazzi Gelato. My grandfather, Anthony Camella, also known as Max Camella, uh, he started uh, Italia Ice Cream Company back in 1953. You can taste a bit of uh, his inspiration and uh, artisan approach and what we do here today. Gelazzi is a family business. It's myself, it's my partner Lee. Lee and I have known each other since 1983. We went to school together. She has some very good recipes. Uh, we, we collaborate on a lot of them and uh, she has an eye for taste. We have something for everybody. We have frozen confections that we make. We have traditional Italian pastries. We have cannoli, we have scudiadelle, we have Italian cookies. And you're gonna get a piece of Italian American culture. Gelato, we make it in small batches. And a small batch is probably the equivalent of two gallons at a time, three pounds. So to be able to keep up with the demand, because we're, we're in a hot climate, you gotta make it every day. So there's one discipline, you gotta get up at five. You gotta source the ingredients. You got 24 different flavors. So you make a commitment to your product. Pistachio is a great traditional Italian flavor. If the pistachio is green, and I mean like bright green, like a lot of American ice creams, it's not real. We use what's called pistachio puro, pure pistachio. We mash the pistachios. We add sugar, and then we add the dairy. We put it in this machine, we wait seven, eight minutes. This is it. This is what everybody comes here for. We put a piece of what we do, our artistic expression and our passion for gelato into every scoop that everybody tries. There's all kinds of things people can do in the world, but when you're a gelatieri or a person that makes gelato, nothing is better than seeing a smile come to somebody's face and go, wow, did you make that? And, and you're making people happy. You're inspiring them to flavor. You're, you're giving them a taste of something that just brings joy into their day, into their moment. Out of all the things to do, it's just a great business to be in because it brings pleasure to people.
To learn more about the art of gelato, like Gelazi on Facebook. Back here on the boulevard, eight Texas sculptors are sharing with us their work and their sense of whimsy and fun as part of a public art exhibit entitled True South. Helping to answer all the questions that we might have about this display is one of the co-curators, Chris Silkwood. Hello, Chris. Hello. Okay, we start with whimsy and fun, and boy, are they ever. They are. They are, and it's one of the reasons why people love it so very, very much. Okay, explain what it is, because we've got a bunch of sculptors, eight of them as we said, yes. who have put out these pieces for us. Why? What's the method to the madness? Well, about three years ago, um, I, with Gus Kupriva who, of Redbud Gallery, who is the co-curator of this project, we got together, and Gus has always been very intense about wanting to increase public art in the city of Houston. This Esplanade is a declared scenic right-of-way for the city, and we thought it's the perfect place for it. So we organized a small committee, we raised funds, we received a grant through the mayor's office, and we did the first project, which was called True North. And the reason for that is because this Esplanade literally runs precisely True North. So we chose eight sculptors of the Heights area predominantly to exhibit in that, and we received a temporary uh, permit from the city for a nine-month e exhibit. It was so popular, people were begging us, please do it again, <laughs> have another exhibit. So we then put together this exhibit, which is called True South, because obviously if it runs North, True North, and you turn south. around and go in the other direction, it's going to run True South. So we broadened the scope of the sculptors for this project, chose eight new ones, and we now have True South, which will be up through mid-December of this year. Tell me a little bit about when we talk about public art, how interactive are we supposed to be with it? I remember the lawn chairs in the old one, people would get up and get pictures and yes. wouldn't. Now with all of this, are we supposed to get involved? What's, what's your view? Yeah, and you know, it's a great question. Um, we want people to be able to touch and feel and walk around and, and so forth. And if it looks like it's okay, I have seen children, you know, standing <laughs> on areas of it. We ask people, obviously, to be respectful because it is public art, but we want them taking photographs. We want them to sit in Tara Conley's, you know, bunny and the opposite side of it that's hollow and take pictures of their kids and so forth so we we welcome interaction okay take me through a few of the pieces wow. they're all incredibly fun and wonderful the first at the beginning of the boulevard in the 400 block is tim glover and tim has large pieces also at the end of washington avenue at the roundabout where you can see other pieces of his work a texas artist uh, it's called whirlwind and it's just a gorgeous piece and then you come down here to see the sock monkey we all grew up with i mean i know i did with sock monkeys and so forth we have uh, an exhibit by emily sloan which is a victorian looking lamp which is so perfect for the heights neighborhood we have sharon copriva and her piece called marcella which is an ode to marcella perry who had the first uh, bank uh, and lending institution in the Heights. And in her early years, she wanted to be a dancer. And so Sharon <laughs> resurrected the dancer with the winged, you know, woman. We also have a piece by Kermit Eisenhut, which is the large heart uh, figure by Mark Bradford, the well-known um, art car guy who's won first place on many occasions for his fantastic uh, art car. Um, we have Tara Conley's bunny, which is incredible, and you can sit inside of it. It's just a pure joy. When you take all the pieces and put it together, are we trying to say something in particular with this exhibit? You know, what Gus and I wanted with the very first one and with this one was to avoid controversy as much as possible. <laughs> not that controversy in art is not a good thing. However, because we're in a residential neighborhood. We have people visiting this historic district from all over. We wanted to keep it whimsical and fun. So that has been the ongoing theme through both True North and the True South exhibit. 
And to learn more about this and so much more about what's going on in the art scene in Houston, where can people go? Well, we suggest that they go to FreshArts.org. They are one of our uh, partners in this project. They're a major arts organization that serves the entire city, and that would be a good location. And they can also go to Bookmon online and get a catalog for this uh, exhibit, too. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. the fun and the whimsy. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next, we're off to Tampa, Florida to check out the Urban Conga, a company reimagining public spaces to encourage exploration, interaction, and informal learning. I was doing a kind of a little like, pop-up event thing in downtown Tampa where I had this like 12-foot beach ball out there doing like projections on a wall, getting people playing. This homeless guy came over and he was like, you know, asking for money, the typical thing. And I was like, oh, you know, we don't have any money, you know, but you can like play with our stuff. Middle class family playing like two kids, parents playing with the beach ball. And you saw this homeless guy kind of work his way over. And then slowly the barriers began to break down and they started like playing with one another. That's when I, I quit my job and I just kind of went into this thing full time because it was like, this actually can make a difference. My name is Ryan Swanson. I'm the founder of the Urban Conga. And the Urban Conga is a nonprofit that promotes community activity and social interaction through play. What we do is we go to underutilized spaces and bring interactive installations to promote activity and creativity and exploration. The Urban Conga started in my thesis about a year and a half ago. We went on a tour right after that, traveled around nine different cities, kind of struggling with the same problem of Tampa with that, that lack of activity happening in the street level. We usually start from like just a kind of collaborative uh, meetup where we all just sit and talk about different ideas and what we could create. And I love having like ideas from people of different backgrounds, not just like an architect or a designer, but like anybody from like a banker to, you know, store owner and just talk about ideas and sketch things out. Yeah, so with the ping pong table, um, a few years back I actually backpacked through Europe and I saw ping pong tables everywhere, all in the parks and they were so like highly used, also in like seen them in bigger cities um, and they were I just so much activity to downtown. So I always just wondered why we didn't have them down here in Tampa. I saw that like the prices were outrageous kind of for them so I was like oh we can design and make something for way less of a cost but way better design. Then I kind of came up with the idea and awesome Tampa Bay which is a local grant program for uh, different people with awesome ideas, uh, approached us and we applied to it and got a grant. So that helped us build the first table. So we built the table um, and then we brought it and donated it to downtown to kind of show the, the success of the activity that the ping pong table would bring. We opened an office like right in the middle of downtown, overlooks the ping pong table. Um, we wanted to be right here in downtown to be able to bring out our stuff and kind of have the city as our playground type of thing. We're hoping like, you know, people will see what we're doing, maybe just in our studio space, more artists and, and creators will move in and just kind of spark that interest. Lights on Tampa uh, essentially is to a, a big event in downtown to bring more life to downtown through lights. So all the installations uh, have to do with lighting under the bridges or interactive shows with lighting or, or urban furniture or different sculptures. What we're gonna do is bring these interactive pieces that light up. So it's essentially these light pyramids that you can connect together and begin to build different seating arrangements, different just free form sculptures, kind of the same idea as our connector pieces, the white pieces, um, but more on a three dimensional standpoint where they also light up and will be interactive with one another and provide public seating where people can make their own seating arrangements and make their own urban furniture pieces. Yeah, so the musical park bench uh, idea came from why sit when you can play? So we want to introduce this idea of play and this musical instrument where it gets people up and active and engaging with one another. So then they actually begin to talk to each other and begin to play this instrument and work together. And then at the same time, it's not just an activity, but it's also a spectacle for people around to watch. How we make the musical bench um, is by, you know, we get, first of all, we developed in the computer and we developed this, this structure. And then we make the keys by getting a maple, like a hardwood, kind of has a resonation to it. And then we slowly carve it out and, and you know, tune it through these, through carving the, like the less, the more we take out, the higher the pitch. So we try to get the, the sound. So as we cut it, we kind of listen to the tune. So it's all handcrafted. Um, and 
yeah, that's kind of how it's made. The kit of imagination is essentially a bunch of pieces that fit with one another. Um, one of our designers that designed it, Brennan, he uh, designed it like, so almost like different furniture pieces you can make out of it, different things. And we brought it out and the idea is like almost like a Lego set where kids can create whatever they kind of want. There's no limitations, everything slots together. It's crazy what people create. Like kids have created giant helicopters they can wear and like run around in. The whole idea with the Urban Conga is the idea of the conga line. We're always down to collaborate. We want people to jump in line and work with us. Play matters because it creates that activity and it creates that social interaction that we're slowly losing, you know, in our society. Everybody, you know, the big social media boom and everybody's just addicted to their phones and their computers and everybody's kind of stuck on these daily routines where it's like, get in my car, drive to work, get back in my car and go home. Like people are, you know, people forget how to play. Like as you get older, you forget how to play. So what we're trying to do is, is, is bring that back, break those routines, get people, you know, interacting and get that activity happening in downtown. And then that starts to help people coming into downtown and starts to help people going to the local businesses and then that really starts to develop the urban fabric from a small scale level so you know you look at it and people think oh we got to build 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 but that's not really how you're going to get people in downtown you're going to get people in downtown by making your downtown a cool fun place to be for more information visit theurbanconga.com up next we take you to the loveland sculpture invitational in northern colorado once hailed as the largest outdoor sculpture event in the country we are very proud to say that the Loveland Sculpture Invitational is the largest outdoor sculpture show in the United States. Loveland is known for sculpture, it's known for art and the artists that live here. We're very lucky to have the you know, diversity in artists and mediums that we have here. I like big heavy things for some reason. I don't know why, but if I can't use a forklift to move it, then I don't call it art. My pieces are absolutely one of a kind, and I couldn't make the same thing twice even if I tried because they have a mind of their own. I have a 600 pound piece that turns in the wind, which could get a little dangerous, so it has to be put in the right spot without kids to be hanging on it because that's the first thing I'd want to do as a kid. But yeah, most of my things that can move, move. And all of different textures and colors and patterns have started to weave themselves together into a really coherent language so that I'm able to speak a really coherent sense of beauty, of aesthetics, and of meaning. And a lot of my pieces really have a sense of presence to them. So it's just been a wonderful surprise and I feel like I'm just getting started. We have over 200 artists that are originally from Iceland that come from New York that come from California, Texas. We have them from everywhere, and even artists right here in Loveland. Once in a while, I take a perfectly good shovel because I need something that size and ruin it. But most of it is found pieces or salvage pricing. Stainless steel, bronze, and copper are my absolute favorite because they're so shiny, they're so reflective, and it's exciting to see what happens because most of my metals are recycled. They're scratched and they're gnarly, and I get to transform them. All that old gets to come into new, and I get to breathe new life into it. It's shiny, and a girl can never have enough sparkle. I'm carving in cottonwood bark right now, and when I carve cottonwood bark, it's a soft enough wood that I can use just a pocket knife and an X-Acto knife with the number 11 blade. It's the only two tools I use when I carve cottonwood bark. It's fun to carve, it's easy, it's fast. He started actually adding fabric onto his wooden sculptures. He said, well, what if I do the sculpture and then paint it into a painting? it then becomes something completely unique. It's neither one or the other. And he intends for it to disappear into the painting. We have had a large array of people come to Loveland just to see art and just to cast their pieces. There are multiple foundries here. There are multiple suppliers, which makes this place so special for artists. They can have all of their services and all of their processes right here in Loveland, and it has just produced a large community of people who really value art. 50% of the time I create it as I go, and oftentimes I'm wondering if I'm going to take it back and have to scrap it and start all over, but so far I've been able to make 
something out of everything? Primarily, I'll be inspired by something, either nature or an expression that someone said, and, and I'll feel it in my body. I'll start with a general idea of what I want, and then my job is to get out of the way and allow the work to just come through. What end form product it has, it's magical, and it's exciting because I don't know. We'll see it when it finishes. I'm continually surprised by what has been coming out of me. Honestly, five years ago when I started this, I was making big vases, big vessels. So they were functional work, you know, because I was an engineer for 15 years, and that was kind of the safe zone. And I really didn't uh, experience myself as an artist, truly, more as a craft person, you know? And then really in the last few years, my art, the art has just been getting more and more expressed and more and more rich and vibrant. Every person who views a piece of art comes to the art with their own experiences in life. And a piece of art should evoke what the artist is intending, but there's also what they bring to it. I have a lot of friends that say, I wish that I could be artistic. And I tell you, you don't have to be artistic, you just have to start. If I would invite anybody to see that they may have an artistic talent that's unknown. No matter who you are, you can find some art in yourself, and if you want to express that, then just jump. Mm -hmm. To learn more, go to lovelandsculptureinvitational.org. And finally tonight, we visit a brewing factory in Clifton Park, New York, where the Schmoltz Brewing Company is responsible for the creative flavors, intricate bottle art, and punny titles that make every variety of Hebrew beer unique and interesting. This is the kind of company you get when you let an English major dream up a beer company. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm the owner of Schmaltz Brewing Company in Clifton Park, New York. We don't have formal mission and vision statements like we would in a uh, venture capital business model. This has been a very organic project for 17 years, creating Schmaltz Brewing Company. We come up with beers that are more based on concept and creativity than on market needs or trends or things like that. We're really into making these special products for ourselves and for the people that we love to drink beer with. There were a couple of kids in my school that were Jewish, myself one of them, growing up in an area that wasn't particularly Jewish at the time in Northern California. And we thought, we need our own beer. What if we had one and be the only Jewish celebration beer in the country? We call it Hebrew. Punchline would be don't pass out, pass over. A little bit later, about 10 years later, when I was in my late 20s, I had the bug and I just started looking into what it would take to make a little bit of beer and call it Hebrew. It worked out to find what's called contract brewing. And it was just an opportunity to celebrate my own culture and what I was proud of and interested in. The very first batch of Hebrew Genesis Ale was 100 cases, hand bottled, hand labeled, delivered around in my grandmother's car because I didn't own a car at the time. It's been, you know, an endless series of challenges and, and adjustments because I never came from a brewery background. I didn't have a business background. And when you're trying to schlep around the country selling a beer called The Chosen Beer and you've got a dancing rabbi looming over a landscape from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Stones of Jerusalem, it's a very different endeavor than home brewer turned, you know, professional brewer with a dog or a fish or rolling hills, which is very typical of craft beer. I've tried to jam as many punchlines as I possibly could onto beer labels, but at the same time, we really take the beer seriously. It is supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be unique, it's supposed to be super creative, but we want the quality to be as good as the very best craft beers in the country. I did not get into this industry to own stainless steel tanks and pay the mortgage on an enormous warehouse. I got into it because I was excited about the product and the creative process and, and being able to share these wonderful beers on the shelf and in people's pints. I was very happy as a contract brewer and it's still an important part of the industry. So the death of a contract brewer I thought up as a fun celebration and a way to riff on the concept. Brewed with seven malts, seven hops, seven percent alcohol. We released the beer on July 7th, 7-7 and we had it for our first anniversary party, our grand opening here at the brewery. It was such a hit that we decided to make it into a year-round beer. So I'm really excited. It's a delicious black IPA that came out of the gates with very high ratings on the largest beer websites in the country and continues to grow. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. 
think people love having products that have uniqueness and personality that stand out on the shelf, that talk to you in a different way. And it's not really about traditional beer marketing, which, you know, Super Bowl ads and dancing girls and fast cars. And this is really more about a sense of artistry and a sense of creativity and being able to do something we call it handcrafted, but it's, it's every element of the product and the project that is handcrafted as well down to the images that we put on the labels. Our master brewer, Paul Mackerlane, spends hours so that the flavors that are gonna come through are something that's really spectacular and reflects the concept of the beer in the first place. The brewing side is a combination of art and science, and we're really lucky that I have such a great scientist who has this real compelling palette of artistry. We're also really proud of the art that we put on the outside of the label, and I've been working with the brewmaster and the artist for now over a decade on recipe development and translating that into images on the outside of the bottles. It's definitely one of the most fun parts of my job, is to be able to collaborate with these incredibly creative professionals that have brought so much to the Hebrew beer brand and the Schmaltz Brewing Company. Since we're small, we can't afford to make mistakes. We experiment with a sense of integrity, honesty, just like everybody, but we also have a lot of experience behind it. The flavors from the malts, the richness in the mouthfeel, the, the beautiful hop aromas and the flavors that can come from the pine and the citrus, the way those dance with the punchlines and the vocabulary on the outside and the images that are in the labels, and then how that goes into the market, bars, restaurants, and bottle shops around the country how we interact with other brewers and other brewing professionals and the people in our community that we're participating with. That is all, I think, a sign of success, and it goes back to the flavors in each individual beer. And hopefully that entire channel is something that we're really proud of and that we get to share with all these people that are out there and call it Great Craft Beer. To learn more about Hebrew, visit schmaltzbrewing.com. And that brings us to the end of Arts Insight. And just a reminder, the next time you reach for a cold one, be it a gelato or a craft beer, take a moment and think about the artistry that went into that and so many other objects we encounter every day. From all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching and have a great week.